So a couple of weeks after South Africa's national budget, the provinces deliver their budgets as well. They get an apportionment from the state and they're expected to divide the money they get from central government between crucial things like education and health and other requirements. Gauteng MEC for Finance and E-Governance, Barbara Creasy, tabled a 103 billion rand budget for 2016-2017 and the lion's share of the overall budget going to those two big pots, health and education. Gauteng's revenue growing from from about 4.8 billion rand. It's not a huge amount of growth, especially since central government is cutting the budgets of the provinces. This is The Money Makers. I'm Bruce Whitfield. Tonight, looking at uh, the issues and the plans to save money by local government as well as central government, of course. Barbara Creasy with me in studio this evening. Central government gives you an, an apportionment of 100 billion rand or, or, or thereabouts, but slightly less than, than the, over the next three years than you got in the last three. Yes, um, we, we will be receiving a cut of about approximately three billion over the medium term. But obviously when you get a cut, it also means you won't be getting an increase no. uh, in terms of, of cost of living. Um, so in real terms, uh, it does put a, fee, uh, a squeeze on the, the provincial budget. I mean, it seems like a small amount of money. It's effectively a billion rand cut a year. Mm. Um, but if you take a, what you might have expected, a, a 5 or 6% increase each year over the next three years, mm. the compound effect three years from now is pretty severe on local governments, isn't it? It is, and I think the big issue for us is that there is ongoing in-migration into our province. Um, 1.8 million people over the last five years. So what that does is it puts ongoing pressure on your health and education services. These are constitutional rights. You can't refuse uh, to, to service a person who presents at those facilities. So it does mean that the, the jobs of my fellow MECs in health and education will be increasingly difficult over the next couple of years. Fortunately, provincial, Gauteng Provincial Treasury has been well managed. Uh, I, I can thank my predecessor for leaving us with, you know, in a healthy state. What that means is that we will be able to cushion the cuts to a certain extent from our reserves. Uh, but it also means that because we have already been managing our personnel spend, we've already done a, a major consolidation of our entities and uh, we are already cutting, cutting costs on non-core activities, we're in a better place than we might otherwise have been to deal with the situation. What revenue generation opportunities have you got? Because people have got to understand that the, the three tiers of government. There's the local, the municipal level, and their mm. rates and taxes go to fund that municipality. So we can't blame you for the lights out in Santon that might have delayed your journey here this evening. That's a, a municipal issue. Then there's local government, and you get an apportionment from the national government, which gets its money from taxation, and it borrows on local and on international markets. You get 95% of your 103 billion rand budget from central government, it's your budget allocation. The remaining 5% comes from where? Motor vehicle licenses is, is the biggest one. Um, gambling taxes, uh, revenue from our hospitals, patient fees in hospitals. And then obviously there would also be interest the treasury would make from its day-to-day -day mm. investments. Is there an opportunity for you then to grow your revenues independent of the allocation from government? Well, we are at the moment um, reviewing our, the, the costs of our gambling and casino licenses. Um, we do have new regulations that are on the table for public comment. Um, we also have been doing a lot of work with health to try and ensure that there's better administration of patient records so that the collection of, of revenue from patient fees actually reaches the provincial treasury. So th the money may be paid in at the front desk at the hospital but doesn't find us all w all the way yes. back into downtown Johannesburg. I, th I think we, we think that there probably is leakage there. but Can uh, you estimate how much? Is it to the tune of hundreds of millions? Well, we, we definitely think if we can collect revenue properly, uh, yes, they, they could be, we could collect hundreds of millions from patient fees. Okay, so there's a huge amount of, of money leaking out of the system there. Well, we don't know mm. if it's leaking out. Uh, I think that's there's the point. An we don't know. There, there's an assumption, or, and your assumption or, is to the tune of hundreds. perhaps, you know, um, because there, there isn't a proper system of collection, perhaps then uh, if, if somebody says, no, no, I won't pay you today, I'll come back tomorrow, 
nobody worries about it. Yeah, so no, it's an inefficient. There's an mm. inefficiency in the system. Well, vehicle licenses, for example, much easier. There's a computerized system. It says this person has applied yes. for the license. The disc has been handed over. They have forked up the the cash for that particular disc. It needs to be systemized like but that. Th but that itself was a was a process of reform mm. about three four years ago. And I must say, the Department of Transport's done a sterling job there. Now, but is there an opportunity to raise funds? So you you don't go like uh, the municipalities do to capital markets, for example, to raise no. money. We we I mean, obviously, if we want to borrow, we need permission from National Treasury because it affects the sovereign debt. Yes. Um, so we do have a loan, and that that relates to the car train, um, and that loan is due to be paid off next year. Uh, so and that's done purely out of hard train revenues? Um, yes, and uh, no, provincial government okay. is repaying that loan. All right. Uh, but but hard train itself is a remarkable success story, so much Indeed. so that there are big expansion plans for the next 20 years being rolled out. Will the Gauteng government again borrow money, or will that go to Gauteng's own balance sheet? What we're doing at the moment is a, is a feasibility study or the Gauteng Management Committee, and obviously we will, once we get the results of that feasibility study, we will have to look at it. I think that um, we know that around the globe there are some innovative ways of, of funding rail development because property owners and developers recognize that the introduction of rail dramatically increases the value of properties. Mm. Um, there, there was a very interesting study that the Gauteng Train Ad Management Agency has done on the increase of property values along the route. You, do, you just look at the nodes and the yes. increased densification around Santon, for example, and, of blocks and of flats Bank. and all of that yes. sort of stuff. Rosebank, Melrose, mm. those areas. Mm. And even, I'm sure, around Bramfontein and the city around Park Station, ultimately there will be urban renewal as more people want to live closer and closer to the form of transport. It's the, the case studies from around the globe. This 103 billion rand, three quarters of it goes into the, the bottomless pit of health and education. Are you getting bang for your buck out of those, out of those two services? Look, I think as far as education goes, um, the flow-through rate, last year we had a situation where 77% of those who started school in 2004 matriculated in 2015. Uh, that is the best flow-through rate in the country. And I think it's a far cry from what we sometimes read about in the media, mm. that only a third of children, etc., etc. Um, what I think is also encouraging about those results is that we did have 38,000 matriculants who qualified to go to university. So I think both quantity and quality are improving there. But then you look at the job that Paniyas Lusufi has got this year, that there are more children than places. And so classrooms are being getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and there's less and less space for these little kids who, who are going into interstate schools. That's precisely why we've, we've said that we need to dip into our reserves over the next three years and uh, we'll be putting 1.7 billion extra toward education. Obviously, um, MSC Le Sufi would, or would never feel that it was enough. We, uh, we understand that. Um, and having been in his shoes, I sympathize mm. with him. But uh, both with health and education, I think we, we are dipping into the reserves. But can you keep up with demand? If you're getting, as you suggested at the beginning of our conversation, in the last five years, what was it, 1.8 million extra mm. people into Joburg mm. in five years, we've got to assume that the next five years are possibly similar. Mm. Can you possibly maintain uh, any sort of standard with the budgetary constraints that you have, the inability to raise the finance that you need, and the very limited resources at your disposal? That's why the paperless classroom innovation is interesting because I think that what that obviously is looking at is if you have scarce good teaching skills, how do you make those available to the system as a whole? How do you support large learner numbers in classrooms with, with IT? And I, th I think that there's some really interesting experiments going on there. Um, certainly generating excitement amongst learners and teachers. And uh, I think that in, in a short while, MEC Le Sufi will be doing some kind mm -hmm. of evaluation, and I'm sure there, there are interesting lessons there about how this, this kind of technology can And assist. all of that does make small inroads into addressing these issues. But in the next five years, can you keep up with the budgetary constraints and the huge demands that are being put upon you? We don't have a choice. Mm. Uh, we have to try 
Uh, as I say, I think that the, the Treasury is healthy, it's stable, and uh, I think we, we are, have also been experimenting with off-budget financing of infrastructure. Off-budget financing means? Um, Public-private partnerships. Uh -huh. uh, we have it's got to be the future, surely. Yes. We have the Gauteng Infrastructure Financing Agency. We have put seven projects in the marketplace uh, at the moment. We are doing feasibility studies on another nine. We will, we will be bringing some of those to the market at the Gauteng Infrastructure Investment Conference later this mm -hmm. year. Um, I, I find that uh, very exciting because uh, it's a way of, of keeping up with increasing demand yeah. in, in a limited fiscal space. Disappointing that 908 million rand went back to national government because it wasn't spent by the local department of human settlements. I mean, that's devastating. I mean, that goes to a management issue um, w within the department. Well, I think, I think that um, Premier Makura has already brought new leadership into that well, Paul department. Paul Mashitile back from Parliament, right? To, That's to right, run yes. The, to run that division. Yes. And he's got a, a, a decent track record in local yes. government. Yes, um, and, and he's no stranger to housing. He has served in that portfolio before. There is also a new acting head of department. And we're looking forward to his budget speech where I think he will be outlining plans to accelerate the, the development of the mega human settlements, but also plans to accelerate spending. It's a considerably difficult task, and uh, it's one that you're welcome to, frankly, <laughs> because <laughs> managing any form of budget mm -hmm. is really difficult. National government, of course, passes the responsibility of schools and, and hospitals and housing onto provincial governments. The Gauteng MEC for Finance and E-Governance, Barbara Creasy, thank you for coming, and thank you for watching this evening. There'll be more money-making issues, money-spending issues in the next show. Thank you so much for watching The Money Makers. Good night.